thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jeremy. And uh, uh, hello to everyone out there who's uh, watching. I, my brief today is to talk about the HIV epidemic, the 100 years, going back to kind of 1920, maybe even earlier, 1884. And then by the end of the uh, session with you this hour, kind of looking at where we're going to in the future. Let me start with uh, Michael Marmot's uh, quote here from The Lancet uh, in 2006. The unnecessary disease and suffering of disadvantaged people, whether in poor countries or rich, is a result of the way we organize our affairs in society. I think this is epitomizes the situation of HIV, particularly in Africa, if we go back in time and we look at where we've been. But I want to start in this particular year and where we are now. Again, looking at a recent uh, review from uh, Tara Schwitz and, uh, and Tony Fauci um, in 2019, looking at the positive uh, consequences for science and healthcare of HIV AIDS research. And I'm sure everyone out there is aware that there are many very positive consequences of, of the work that has been done on HIV over the last uh, uh, 40 years that we've been aware of this pandemic. The regulation of the human immune system. Said so in the 80s when I started out with HIV uh, patients and looking after them, uh, we hardly knew about CD4 counts, CD8 counts, and, uh, and that whole area has now been unpacked for us in the last 40 years. Targeted antiviral drug development. There were very few um, viral, antiviral drugs in my earlier career. Now there are literally hundreds of uh, both for HIV, other viruses, hepatitis C virus, for instance, um, an amazing uh, change in that uh, uh, space. Probing the B cell repertoire, very important new discoveries, uh, structure-based vaccine development and design, um, as we're seeing particularly with COVID um, at the moment. Um, advances in aid, HIV AIDS related technologies, the diagnostics, um, the point of care um, tests that we can do rapid, uh, amazing stuff that has happened, viral load technology in particular, role of immune activation in disease pathogenesis, um, and thanks to a lot of the work from the Cape Town team who have uh, defined iris for us and helped us to understand what is happening in our patients. Um, comorbidities in HIV disease, uh, what we're looking to in the future and what is already here. And then advances in the management of uh, HIV AIDS related condition. But if we stop for a moment and just look, take an overview of South Africa and HIV and AIDS. And this is data from the uh, UNAIDS uh, 2020, looking at South Africa with somewhere between 7.5 and 7.8 or 9 uh, million people living with HIV. 19% of our uh, 15 to 49 year olds, 19%, one in five, an awesome number that um, are HIV positive. 200,000 new infections in the year 2019, 72,000 AIDS related deaths, even now 40 years into this pandemic. Um, and then 71% of adults on antiretroviral treatment. Well, uh, some of our data suggests that it may be a little bit higher than that. 47% uh, of children on antiretroviral treatment. So we've come a fair way. And uh, I'm looking here at uh, Peter Pio's uh, paper from The Lancet 2015. And if you look at the right at this graph that Peter's given us, and you look at this pink triangle, that's the African region. And we're going from 2003 to 2014. And you and I can see that the uh, number of people living, receiving ARVs is increasing. And Africa, and I would say, and I'll show you data in a moment, Southern Africa and South Africa is the major 
reason for this particular awesome, frightening um, development in terms of where we are headed. A few years back in South Africa, around about 2004, at the time that um, antiretrovirals were introduced in South Africa in the public sector, uh, life expectancy had fallen, both in males, uh, in blue, females in green. But with antiretroviral therapy, as you can see, there was a dramatic improvement in pain. And as we look over time, uh, with the start of antiviral therapy, back around about somewhere between 1996 and 1998, you can see that very clearly the number of new infections globally started falling, as did later on the number of AIDS-related deaths. That was the first decade of antiviral therapy. The second decade has also passed. And now we are in 2021. And this is an article from Parker and Judge et al. Uh, the African Centers for Disease Control and UNAIDS had a recent um, conference in Mozambique. And they had sent us a review of uh, what was discussed at that particular meeting. And it's coming through in this SAJ uh, HRD mid uh, next, next month. So look out for that. But this is a preview of that, and I'm showing you here in red, South Africa, the number of people living with HIV, and this is Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. And you can see that this is the elephant in the room. This is us, we are here, South Africa, and the numbers dwarf the remainder of the Eastern and Southern part of our continent. Uh, the data that uh, they share with us, again, South Africa, I've shown you in the, uh, in the arrow. Prevalence, yes, the prevalence is slightly greater in Eswatini, Botswana, Lesotho, but the numbers in our part of the world are so much uh, greater. Incidents, likewise, it seems as though new cases, maybe uh, we're looking better, but again, the numbers uh, and the prevalence of HIV slightly higher in the rest of um, our, sub, uh, our Southern African region in particular. Looking at UNA, this is again the 1990-90 targets for all ages, South Africa um, coming through in 2020. 92% of people aware of their status of whom 95% are on treatment, i.e. 70%, and of whom, of the 75% on treatment, 92% are virally suppressed. In total, 64% of those living with HIV. And from the Visa 4.1 project, from uh, Lee Johnson and Rob uh, Donington uh, and Arun Muller, you can see here, we're looking at the HIV cascade, the total population of South Africa in 2017. Those who know their status, um, those who are on, on art, those who are virally suppressed, under 15s, then 15 male plus, 15 plus females and total. And you can see that when we look at the percentages in this table, they are not on the whole impressive. Combination HIV prevention, you're familiar with this slide. Um, we've shown this to you over the years. But, but just to remind you that, yes, we've got a armamentarium uh, available to us. And we particularly now have pre-exposure PrEP prophylaxis, probably one of the most important advances in the last uh, four or five years. And we have much that can help to prevent the spread of this epidemic, but we are not entirely winning. So let me go back to my opening remarks, the start of this whole tragic story. And uh, to introduce you to Faria's uh, paper in science, in 2014, one of the seminal papers, and in a moment I'll introduce you to uh, Mike Warabee's uh, paper uh, in Science and Nature um, a few years back as well, two of the seminal articles on the origins of the pandemic 
And let me read from the beginning, the, the, the first uh, paragraph of Nuna Faria's paper. AIDS is one of the most devastating infectious diseases in human history. And its cause, HIV, has been responsible for nearly 75 million infections. Shortly after the first reports of AIDS in the United States in 1981 and the isolation of HIV two years later, the disease was discovered to be established in heterosexual populations of Central and East Africa, suggesting a much older and to that point hidden history of a pandemic in Africa. We know now that the simian immunodeficiency virus has multiple forms in different uh, um, monkey species, um, primate species, and you're seeing some of the primate species in front of you with their own individual simian immunodeficiency virus. When we look at humans, we know that we, uh, we got our particular uh, HIV from a chimpanzee simian immunodeficiency virus. And that SIV was probably passage through macaque monkeys and maybe, her, maybe originated with the sooty manga bees. We know that the Western gorilla, from whom we get the P and the O um, uh, types, that, that that originated from the chimpanzee. And, uh, and uh, Paul Sharp and uh, Beatrice Hahn give us some really fascinating kind of on-the-spot um, discovery work following chimpanzees and picking up their poop and assessing that for nucleic acids and finding host viral, <coughs> host viral DNA um, in these animals. Uh, amazing work as one looks back. I'd like to take a, a step back and look at the broader picture uh, from 19 from 1884 to 1920, and we're going to take for the discussion this afternoon, 19, 1920 as the kind of origin of HIV in, in people. Um, we look back and we see that Central Africa and, uh, and particularly Eastern Africa were the origins of HIV-1 and HIV-2. 1920, um, continues to, to make the point in, in a really uh, beautiful article, uh, and so well written, the virus probably traveled via ferry, and we are looking at a region up here in the Cameroons, via ferry down uh, this particular river, um, during the period of, uh, of the Sangha River, down to Kinshasa, Brazzaville, Kinshasa, down here. During the period of the German colonization of the Cameroons, that was 1884 to 1916, fluvial connections between southern Cameroons and Kinshasa were frequent due to the exploitation of rubber and ivory. And in around 1920, someone with HIV traveled from Cameroon to Leopoldville, now Kinshasa, Brazzaville, in the DRC. So, so a kind of seminal statement about the origin. And if we look, the golden kind of ring here is the origin of our HIV from chimpanzees found in the forest in this particular region. And as I've just said, that uh, HIV got into, uh, SIV got into humans, traveled down to Kinshasa, and we take up the story from there. What we're looking at here is an unscaled phylogeographic history of a pandemic of HIV. And we're looking particularly at the subtype B, which is the kind of uh, global subtype in uh, Europe and North America, Australia, and so on, and our subtype C in South Africa and in Southern Africa. With an original, and these are the time dates going back in time from 2000, 1980, 1960, going back with this particular uh, molecular clock, retrograde molecular clock, going to original species, having picked up uh, tissues 
infected with HIV virus and looking at the rate of change over time, we can, in this, uh, in this clock, go back to the origins of the viral infection. Um, in this particular paper, they also mention that the railway system, as well as the, uh, the river, rivering systems were important in the, in the transportation of the virus. And particularly here, when you're looking at the railways, uh, Bridgi Mai, Lakasi, Lumbabashi, um, these were areas where we believe the sea, uh, particular clay, the sea clay that we have in Southern Africa originated or came from uh, in particular. Michael Warabi um, has also written extensively as nature in particular um, over the years on the diversity. And what he shows in this particular paper of issues from uh, the Dossi or from the Congo area in 1960, tissues in the same area, Kinshasa, in 1959, and with um, other, other material from other parts of the world, particularly <clears throat> in Europe and whatever, from time uh, past, looking again with this particular um, skyline tree pot uh, plot, we can trace back the origin of the virus to 1884-1920. And the point that Michael is making in this paper again, a superb paper, excellent, good evening reading, is that already in 1959, in the 1950s, in Kinshasa, multiple strains, multiple subtypes were present um, at that particular time, suggesting that there had been a spread in that region uh, and the um, uh, period, a long period of time, that allowed the virus spread and for different clades to develop. In uh, this picture, uh, Michael is also showing us from 1880, the point that he's making is that Kinshasa, Brazzaville, Yunda, uh, Bangui, uh, and so on, were, were actually in the 1890s and 1900s, were relatively small towns. But as the population grew, which it did in 1940, 1950, as you're seeing, that particular, um, as you're seeing in this graph, that is one of the reasons why um, this particular HIV in that region uh, remained for many, many years, decades, kind of below the radar. But once it had gotten into a large city, Kinshasa, by the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, the virus was established. Let's go then to 1981. So when we're looking here at the particular bee clade, again, um, we're looking at its travel, and we believe it traveled to the Caribbean from Africa, from West Africa, from mercenaries and people who come to um, uh, be active in the colonial wars of that time in the uh, 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, the bee clade was planted in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the Latin America, and that was a clade that spread up into uh, North America itself. And in, again, in this other graph that uh, you'll be, you're seeing uh, from uh, Michael Warabee, again, you're looking at the precursor to the Caribbean and then the United States uh, HIV epidemic, the precursor in black is the African original clade. And uh, Michael, as I say, has done some amazing work that he shares with us in this particular paper um, from Nature. Another point coming from uh, James Curran's paper, um, and James Curran at the time was the director of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, looking at the AIDS epidemic. This is a couple of years after uh, 1981 that he's writing, and he's looking at uh, men in particular who are experiencing various, uh, what we would now call AIDS-defining criteria, Kaposi sarcoma, pneumocystis, and so on, and tracing them to the index case. 
And one of the seminal take home messages for us in the 1980s, when we were kind of trying to grapple with this epidemic and pandemic, was that it was clearly at this particular moment, we, the virus had been discovered, but we hadn't any means to uh, diagnose it in people. This was our way, clinical way of diagnosing who was uh, infected. And this was very clearly a sexually transmitted infection, an STI. And, and with that particular discussion, uh, comes and came the whole question of stigma something that we've grappled with certainly in Africa and that has not yet led the discussion. There's a social gradient, and I'm quoting again from Michael Marmot, there's a social gradient in health that runs from top to bottom, where inequalities in health are avoidable yet not avoided, now inequitable. AIDS, Voices from the Epidemic, um, an oral history uh, from Ronald Bayer and Gerald Oppenheimer, um, just reminding us of what happened in those early days, in the period, and this is America, the American epidemic in 1981. Uh, in the period of October 1980 to May uh, 1981, five young men, all active homosexuals, were treated for biopsy probe and pneumocystis Paranyza was called then pneumonia at three different hospitals in Los Angeles, California. In red, the occurrence of pneumocystis in these five healthy individuals without a clinically apparent underlying immunodeficiency is unusual. The fact that these men, men were all homosexual suggests an association between some aspects of homosexual lifestyle or disease acquired through sexual contact and pneumocystis in this population. And you remember seeing, um, those of you are old enough to remember, and I'm uh, uh, sadly aware that some of my uh, listeners are probably too young to remember this, but in the Washington Post, August the 30th, 1980, two mysterious diseases killing homosexuals, the MMWR um, had, uh, had uh, uh, case stories in the 1980 and 1981 and after that, and you remember uh, Rock Hudson, and sadly, I'd like to say to Anthony, uh, Anthony Fauci, things haven't changed, mate. They haven't changed. Dr. Fauci, you are killing us. So that was back in the 80s, and Tony was famous then, as he clearly is now, and uh, he's not immune to being in the spotlight. When this particular picture came out uh, back in the 80s, uh, or was it early 90s, uh, it really brought a lump to one's throat. Um, uh, these fantastic blankets, quilts um, here in Washington, obviously, and, and just almost a mile long of quilts made in remembrance of the, the multitude of men and their partners and women and children who had died from AIDS uh, in the United States. And, and kind of um, just as, a, as an aside, when I was sitting preparing this talk and thinking about South Africa, and this is obviously uh, a familiar individual, um, but looking at the story, the, the parallel story of HIV and AIDS, I'd like to quote from Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, talking about the situation in Europe in the 1930s and looking at Germany in particular and the uh, upcoming Second World War. What he says is any justice which is only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. It must be saved by something which is more than justice. The realistic wisdom of a statesman is reduced to foolishness, if it is not under the influence of the foolishness of a moral sphere. And, and kind of looking at, at where we are with HIV, we, we do need our politicians, but we need wisdom. We need men and women with wisdom. And uh, we'll get back to that point later uh, in this discussion. 1983, 
And thank you to uh, uh, Luc Montanier, Francoise Barreso Lucy from the Pasteur team back in 1983, who were given a piece of lymph node material in, and this uh, amazing lady, who both uh, Luke Montanier and her got the Nobel Prize some years later, um, discovered the virus, which as you remember, she sent to uh, Bob Gallo in the United States, and he confirmed that there was a virus there, and in fact, it was the HIV virus. I think the seminal things at that time, uh, at that particular time in South Africa, the virus was uh, with us and present. Um, by 1985, we had the beginnings of means of testing. And in fact, as it hasn't come back, uh, hasn't come in, uh, David Ho hadn't helped us to uh, uh, measure viral loads at that particular time, but we were having, we did have antibody tests, and as time went by, antigens and combinations of the two. And um, people were drawing a kind of a map of the life survival with HIV. This is later from uh, Mike Cohen's uh, paper back in 2011. Again, another seminal paper, mapping the natural history of HIV. In blue, we're looking at the CD4 count and time falling uh, at a period when you would know that if your patient says CD4 is below 100, below 200, that uh, AIDS, full-blown AIDS, was around about 18 months away. At the same time, the viral load, huge, increase of viral load early on, tapering back to a kind of a set point, what we used to call a set point, about a year and a half later, and then slowly rising when we didn't have any antivirals to uh, high levels at the time of overwhelming AIDS. In the early days, you would look at uh, a sentiment like this, see that there are, um, there are atlas-like ulcers on the lips, and, and there's thrush present. And this is a, pa a patient who Jeremy will remember well, and uh, of uh, one of our patients at the Helen Joseph while I was still there. And this is a patient of mine that I was looking at back in the, it must have been, I think I'd come back from America by then, uh, probably the early 1990s, who had this rash. He had had a sexual contact about uh, two weeks earlier. He allowed me to take this picture of his butt, and he was seroconverting at that time. Thankfully, we now can measure uh, zero, these aspects of seroconversion and of being infected with those diagnostics. Uh, uh, Gerald and Ronald came through to South Africa a few years later. Um, after they'd written the, the story of uh, HIV in their country, in the United States, and interviewed many of us at that particular time. And from their book, I've uh, taken this particular page, and we'll just remind you that the first Black South African heterosexual AIDS cases were two women who had never lived what was then called rural Transvaal, kind of half 10 region, uh, maybe a free state. Uh, these two women were diagnosed with HIV in late 1987. Uh, around about the same time, uh, Ruben Scher was studying minors in South Africa. He was with the SIMR at the time. Um, and he, uh, he had noted an infection rate of 3.8% in Malawian miners in South Africa, but no infection amongst their South African counterparts. But by October 1989 in South Africa, the cumulative number of reported Black AIDS cases um, had risen to 40. By the end of 89, 1989, serum prevalence in some parts of South Africa was already close to 1%. And certainly by the time when the ANC came in at, in 1994, um, I was looking in Hateng and Johannesburg at a serum prevalence in our region of 3%. David Ho came to our rescue in the 1990s 
as did several others, with being able now to measure the virus, doing viral loads. It made a huge difference. And Tom Quinn was one of the eminent people of the day, working in Rakai in Uganda, looking at um, HIV in Central Africa, and made the kind of seminal uh, uh, conclusion that um, serum HIV RNA concentration is related to the transmission probability in discordant couples. The higher the semen count of virus, the greater the likelihood of transmission. With Mike Cohen, a few years later, in 2007, uh, in again another seminal um, article of his, um, looking at the probabilities of transmission, heterosexual transmission uh, in the United States, uh, looking at the seminal uh, HIV viral load. And ultimately, and I'm jumping the gun here somewhat, viral loads on art, U equals U, undetectable, untransmissible. So this particular science was moving in that direction. I remember um, when uh, first looking at uh, at uh, Stephen and uh, and Robin, that's Steve Lawn and Robin uh, Woods uh, picture here, um, and I can't remember when that when they showed it to us, but I remember thinking, wonderful. This is kind of helps me to understand TB in particular, as uh, and, and in particular why when I give antiviral therapy there is still a lab. Men and women still die in these 90 days, three months after I start. Something that, as you know, uh, Graham down in Cape Town, Graham Mankeys, took up in the whole story of Iris, which hopefully we'll get to in a moment. In 1994, at the time of the uh, incoming new um, ANC government in uh, South Africa. A number of us were at an AIDS conference in Prague when Edward Connor gave his data on AZT in pregnant moms and showed this remarkable improvement in a decreasing transmission to the babes, uh, babies at uh, that particular time. It was the first occasion, to the best of my knowledge, that we had had definite proof that an antiretroviral worked. And it made a huge um, impact at that particular conference in 1994. More recently, from the, uh, what is now called the National Institute, had been the SIMR in the history, became the NI, uh, NRCD. And you see their data um, currently, uh, this is now in 2018, down to less than 2%. Uh, now that we are giving mothers maternal antiretroviral therapy through their pregnancy, getting the transmission rate down to less than 1%. 1996 to 10, uh, 2010, um, other discoveries, particularly uh, looking at the falling off, that acute falling of, of CD4s in the early few weeks of, um, of seroconversion, of getting infection, and discovering that what was happening is that the uh, CD4 cells in the gut were disappearing. And as Jason Brenchley um, and others with him, Mike Nederman, for instance, showed us in really marvelous um, studies, um, looking at uh, CD8, CD4 cells, and looking at, in particular, uh, ribosomal DNA for bacteria, that there was a flooding of the uh, portal system uh, and, the, uh, and the general circulation with uh, these particular um, bacterial components. And the whole concept as a result of then the um, uh, anti the inflammatory um, syndrome, which would lead and has led to our understanding of comorbid disease. That even when HIV is under control, there is still virus present. It hasn't been cured, hasn't been totally eradicated, and the immune system responds to that presence of the virus. Around about this time in 1997, um, I was involved in the Viridine uh, scam, 
uh, as you're hearing, uh, seeing here. Um, and it was the beginning of the denial period that, that kind of undermined the uh, goodwill of the nation and particularly from the politicians who were in leadership at that particular time. And this uh, picture of uh, Matish Abalala and Zaki Ahmad um, conversing at the Toronto International AIDS Conference and uh, Dr. Shabalala, uh, Ms. Imanu saying, shall I repeat garlic? Shall I talk about beetroot? Shall I talk about lemons? These delay the development of HIV to AIDS defining conditions and that's the truth. I've taken Reinhold Niebuhr again from his 1932 book, Politics. Will to the end of history be an area where conscience and power meet? Where the ethical and coercive factors of human life intersect and work out their tentative and uneasy compromises. We weren't about to compromise on antiretroviral therapy. And as you know, we took the government to talk uh, to court. That was the TAC, ourselves, the Southern African HIV Condition Society, and others, the AIDS Law Project um, in particular. And uh, we were able then to get antiretrovirals into the public health system 2003, 2004. What you're looking at is a kind of an overview of the life cycle of a virus, and you'll see punctuated in that life cycle is the other drugs um, that are available, the, the classes of antiretroviral drugs. The, the most recent, and uh, I remember looking at this some years ago, and I see now that uh, these are coming on stream, Catsford Assembly Inhibitors, uh, a, a really kind of a virile um, start to this particular management of this condition. So you're seeing here over time from 1987, Isaac, Isaac and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but here fixed dose combinations come in over that period. And we move from uh, single therapy to dual and triple therapy. And we move on to the next decade, moving into now the third decade, which I haven't added in the screen in front of you, but in fact, a whole number, a new third generation, um, second, third generation uh, integrated inhibitors, cavitegravir, pitegravir, I haven't put in there, uh, and new NRTIs and NNRTIs. So if we look particularly here, um, you'll see that uh, the approval from the FDA, uh, right up until now, again, the Tegrava, Doravarine, uh, TAF, uh, Tamopathy Alephenamide, and the pivotal study, again, from my Cohen's group in North Carolina, the HPTN study, looking at serocon discordant couples, giving the individual who was HIV um, positive, um, what uh, they did here was only one infection. And, and so what the CD4 of the infected partner gave them antiretrovirals and looked to see what happened to the Gordon partner, the one who was uninfected. Well, when you treated uh, them, you gave them early art, treated the one who was infected, irrespective at that time almost of the uh, CD4 count, you in fact had very few. There's a 90%, 97% lower risk uh, than with the delayed. Um, so, so we knew, and uh, Mike clearly um, followed that up with uh, his uh, the, the uh, partner studies that showed us again that uh, U equals U, untransmissible, uh, ultimately, what if the viral is undetectable. Prana, and I'm going to kind of I see my time is almost up, so um, I'm going to say a few words here in terms of Prana and then maybe a few words about where I think things are going. So Temprana was uh, a um, study that was sorry about that. Temprana, a study up in uh, the Ivory Coast, 
looking at immediate antiviral therapy with IPT, with uh, isoniazid preventive therapy, um, looking at another arm, deferred art, and then uh, a um, and then a deferred art uh, with the but only IPT itself, showing pretty conclusively that there was, and you're looking at the uh, blue line, deferred art, and this Kaplan line, cumulative probability of death highest when you deferred art. When you added in IPT, that had a very definite, so even in the deferred arm in gray, when you gave IPT, there was a reduction in the 30-month uh, um, mortality. And the best of the lot was immediate antiviral therapy and isoniazid preventive therapy. Uh, the, the start trial, 57% um, uh, reduction, and this was, okay, we've lost the slide there. The start was a very similar uh, study, uh, not done in Africa, done in many parts of the world, uh, the Insight Start Group, and again, giving immediate as opposed to deferred uh, antiviral therapy, triple therapy, and again, with deferred art, uh, the uh, Katamaya very clearly indicating that there is a problem. Okay, so I think I've got to the end and, and I've got, what, 45 minutes? We've, we've uh, gone through this. And I guess I want to kind of leave you with thoughts about where are we going? So I started with the 1990, 90, or we now call it 95, 95, 95, UN AIDS uh, targets, the goals uh, for the future of uh, getting uh, the world to an end of AIDS by 2030. We're now in 2021, in the middle of 2021, so we've got about um, nine and a half, eight and a half years uh, still to go. And, and the question really that I would want us to think about and consider, and if we were in uh, a place where we could talk together easily, uh, it would be what I would be saying is, hey, we need to ask ourselves, why is it, and is it likely that we'll ever get, or that we'll get in Southern Africa and in South Africa to a place where we can close the book on HIV? This was a quote from a patient in the Agincourt study. It's a, a, a recent updating of the Agincourt study. It's a, a public health uh, group up in northern Mpumalanga. And uh, recently, uh, they were looking at the end of AIDS, HIV and the new landscape of illness in rural South Africa. And uh, the authors went through, looked uh, and just, and took a kind of a, a interviewing program uh, with the patients um, who are on antiretrovirals. And I found, for instance, this particular quote from one of the patients, according to my understanding, diabetes kills, high blood pressure kills. But HIV does not kill. People just kill themselves. Why? Why do I say so? Most people don't adhere to treatment. You eventually die. High blood pressure, you can die with it any time. But HIV does not kill. And I just found that this paradigm, we, we, we're moving from <clears throat> the 1980s, the 1990s, the times that I remember of people dying and on Saturdays and Sundays, as you pass the cemetery, you would just see hosts of coffins and funerals uh, going on. That time, indeed, thank God, has changed and gone. But HIV, has HIV gone? No. And we know that treatment does work, and we know that people are surviving, but we are also aware that there's a cost to that survival. That comorbid disease often occurs at a kind of a, a decade before the, 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 the rest of the uninfected population of the same kind of vintage. So there is a cost to having HIV. And in my estimation, there is a need to get on top of this and get rid of, of this virus. Furthermore, 
and I haven't showed you the data, but we know that the data in our pregnant moms in South, South Africa, a 30% prevalence of HIV infection in our young moms who are having babies has not changed since the early 2000s. It is still in the region of 30%. So that our ability to alter the um, incidence, particularly not in young people, of HIV infection has not really matched our ability to treat. So the question I have for you, my listeners, that you, you folks out there who are listening to me, is what do we do in the future, in these few years that we've got, eight years, nine years left, to, to actually get this virus infection eradicated? And I'm sure that many of you will be asking about uh, vaccines. And as you know, that vaccines hold promise, but we have no particular vaccine as such. Back to Sir Michael Marvin from London. There's a social gradient in health that runs from top to bottom, where inequalities in health are avoidable, yet not avoided, but inequitable. So, so I, I puzzle over why we still have the problem of HIV. And the problem is rooted in the inequities I think, of our system. I will leave it there. And uh, Jeremy, can I hand it over to you? You've got uh, uh, 10 minutes till four o'clock. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. That's a real absolute sort of masterclass in looking back uh, at, at a really incredible time in, in many senses, um, and also a very stark and worrying time you know, in, in many other senses. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's a really good time, as you say, to look back, especially because we faced another pandemic famously in the last year, uh, and there's other aspects coming up as well. You know, and we wonder how much, uh, you know, how much this has, has helped and hindered. I mean, I think HIV in general has, um, has advanced medical science in many ways, thanks to a lot of funding, um, you know, in terms of diagnostics and immunology and therapeutics, of course, antivirals, and we we are now um, bearing some of the fruit of that with COVID. You know, some of the, the rapid of, uh, ability to scale up vaccine production and to develop them is an offshoot of, of HIV, although famously we've not got very far with our own HIV vaccine. But I mean, I wonder, one of the questions that came through was about the role of stigma in spreading all of this, because it is, it is unique in that, well, not unique, but it's unusual and it's one of the few pandemics that spread as a sexually transmitted illness, as opposed to a respiratory illness or a diarrheal illness or something like that. So. Uh, you know, did, it did spread virulently in the first world where it was at the time mostly a, a sort of a gay white man thing, which, you know, a fairly marginalized group. And then uh, in, in Africa, it spread for a long period, obviously, uh, as well, uh, thanks to stigma in part. But I wondered what your thoughts were about the particular role of stigma in this disease in terms of getting it to where it's got. So undoubtedly, that's an issue. Uh, uh, when... I think when, when we looked at the, as you say, in the 1980s in particular, um, the, the response of the gay community in North America and in Europe was to fight against that. As you, I showed you pictures of uh, uh, the Gay Men's Association in New York, uh, in London, uh, and in Paris, uh, lying down on the streets and, and, and holding up placards against Reagan, against Tony Fauci, and so on. Um, an ability, because I think you are educated, have money, have status, to actually um, throw stigma back to the crowd. I think when I look at the, at the epidemic in Africa, and I look at the fact that um, as, we, as we see um, with COVID, as you've just mentioned, uh, no one's ashamed of having COVID and uh, they're not ashamed of their relative dying of COVID. But I, and I imagine others who will be listening to me um, over the years have known dignitaries, politicians who uh, were patients of mine who were HIV positive, uh, who passed away, who died, um, and yet not a word was ever spoken about the, the background um, 
infection that they had. And, and so clearly we have an inability as, a, as Michael Marmot is saying, and in a sense, if, if, um, if Reinhold Niebuhr was still with us, is saying an inability to actually fight for, for being people, being who we are. And, um, and I think, do I think that we'll get to a 2030 without dealing with stigma? No. And, and it's so, so interesting, this um, Asian core study that came through a year or so ago from the uh, WITS uh, group, um, looking at, at people reacting to having um, comorbidities compared to HIV. HIV is, is no longer seen as a death warrant. But nonetheless, it isn't something you're going to brag about and, and uh, gossip about. So I do think stigma is an issue, an ongoing issue, and I think somehow, somehow, people need to be kind of uh, hopefully helped to have a voice. I think of say the Zonda Commission at the moment, and and the fact that the our Prime Minister just. Uh, uh, a few days ago was saying that all of this happened and it was kind of hidden. It was not seen, all of the, the kind of collapse of the government in a sense. Um, surely, surely we need our 60 million people living in South Africa to, to be brought to a place where, like the, the gay youngsters in New York, in Paris, who who refuse to take HIV lying down. Surely our population, the 20% the, the of adults, 19.7% of adults in South Africa, 15 to 49 years age, age group, surely we must be able to get them to, to stand up and be counted and move this kind of trajectory, a target of 95, 95, 95 by 2030 forward. Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, uh, lots of questions uh, coming in. So one of the questions is on what your feelings were about the odds of, of cure for HIV. Is that something you think is on the horizon in the, in the near future or, or is, it, is it still uh, a long way off? So, so cure, I mean, I, what I'd recommend to, um, you know, the folk who are interested in that is the work of Jake Estes um, in the Oregon Animal Farm. He works with chimpanzees and primates. And um, as you know, on Thursday nights, I um, go in with the uh, Pennsylvania group um, discussing HIV and AIDS. And um, Jake Estes was on one of those Thursday night panels last year. Fabulous. I mean, there, there is wonderful research into the cure. Um, fascinating work that it's coming through. So do I think a cure is, um, is going to happen? Yes, I do. I do. Um, uh, when I look at people like Jake and others, um, hell of bright men and women working on a cure for HIV and the data that they show us from the animal models that they've worked with, I think this is incredibly positive stuff. Um, the vaccine uh, would be wonderful because that would help us prevent um, HIV. But we do need to find a cure, and I'm optimistic. Thanks. Um, and then a, a, another a question about one of the books you're mentioning. So, uh, the Shattered Dreams and Oral History of the South African AIDS Epidemic. Is that a book? Uh, we had a, a question is, do you think it's important for, for our docs to read? Is it, does it read well today? Is it, is it very much of its time or is it, is it still got lessons to teach? So, so the, the, both of the books by um, the guys from New York, um, I think I'll really make, they, they are somewhat, they are somewhat uh, dated. And, and the book, uh, Shattered Dreams, um, the South African kind of uh, AIDS, is particularly uh, biased in, in terms of looking at the, uh, gay set, uh, group in South Africa, which was important in the 1980s and the 1990s when, um, uh, when Oppenheimer and uh, uh, his partner came across to us and, and uh, spoke to us about the uh, epidemic. 
So it, it doesn't have, doesn't reflect the heterosexual uh, pandemic uh, in the main. Um, so I do think it is a bit dated. Um, the American uh, epidemic uh, and, and book from Oppenheimer and, and his partner, I think um, really opens one, uh, one's eyes to uh, how um, Jim Curran, others in those early days uh, managed, Tony Fauci, others managed this particular ep epidemic. And it was amazing. And it was an, an, an amazing record of what was happening at that time. Thanks. And then, and then a, a really good uh, uh, question saying, we, we now have access to some of the best ARVs in the world, some of the best diagnostics. What are the current major issues in the field, in your opinion, that need to be strongly advocated? I think, uh, I really do think that um, uh, uh, PrEP, pre-exposure uh, uh, pre, um, uh, prevention um, treatment, is really important and I think long acting, I think uh, with uh, Cavitegrava, long acting, say with together with long acting Rothiverine, um, I would be watching that space. I would be looking at my, my youngsters, uh, 15 year olds, and I'd be saying, hey guys, now is the time to make sure that incident rate of uh, infection is stopped, is, is blocked uh, with these long acting agents that are being used overseas, looked at as um, PrEP. Um, I think that, that to my mind is something to watch in particular. In terms of the new drugs, I'm, I'm all ears when it comes to the uh, capsid inhibitors because um, integrase inhibitors are great, but, um, but everything, everything has its day. And I want to see that for our patients, there is a tomorrow, there is um, a time in the future when we can treat them and care for them. So, so treatment continues to be my interest. As you know, I'm a clinician. I looked after the sick. I love, I love the sick too, and that's been my my job and my career, um, and and that remains for me the kind of nub of what to do. But stopping the new infections, I do think that prep is an important uh, new um, milestone in that particular um, in that particular direction. Yeah, and and Dave, there's uh, one final question, which is perhaps more of a comment. Uh, that's saying that you still owe your followers and students your updated textbook, the clinical practice. Of <laughs> yeah. Says, are we getting this updated textbook any anytime soon? And no, no, no. You see, it was it was a toss up between two things. Either I did the textbook, or I became the editor of the Southern African Journal of HIV Medicine. Um, <laughs> and at the time, it wasn't a it wasn't a difficult choice um, because. Uh, because I felt that uh, we needed the journal. Um, I would, I, I must be honest with you and, and the listeners that, that going back in the history kind of reminds me of my own practice at, um, you know, in private. I spent virtually most of my career. Uh, yes, I am an academic of sorts, but primarily I'm a physician. I love to be next to sick people. Um, and, and that book that I wrote back in 2000, I think we um, published it in 2005, it was written within about six months because I realized the urgency at that time. No one or virtually no one out there had something to put on their desk that would give them a clue as to how to go forward. And remember in 2005, we just started the journal and the uh, society, the HIV society was in its infancy. Um, we needed something to give to people. Um, I can imagine, and, and as I reread my book, that's a lovely book, um, kind of nighttime, bedtime reading in part. <laughs> well, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna push from my side to, to those who commented because I, I arrived, for example, at a conference in Uganda once and someone said, where are you from? I said, South Africa. And they said, well, I've got, do you know Dave Spencer? I've got his textbook. So Dave, you are famous for your textbook, <laughs> among many other reasons. So we, we, we will, I will push for you to, to update your textbook. I still think there's a one. It'd be great, yeah. So, uh, it'd have to be an entirely new textbook. It's <laughs> a different world we're in. Thank you so much for your time, Dave. I mean, I've just, I, I haven't, I mean, you'll see in the chat a little bit in some of the questions. I mean, I haven't um, 
I haven't gone through all of them, but they, they are just brimming with appreciation for your talk and, and for the, the sort of the wonderful retrospective and prospective uh, view that you've, you've been able to, to bring to this, this afternoon. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And I will, uh, we have recorded this. I will put this up on our uh, YouTube account for those who weren't able to make it because I've I got a bunch of emails this morning from people who were dismayed they wouldn't be able to make it. So we will make it available to them as well. Thank you all. Um, and yeah, thanks, Dave. So for the, for those, yeah, thanks guys. For those who want to.